Raquel, we want to invite Brother Ron Toll forward. Brother Ron lives down near Cosby, Tennessee, just a few miles from the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. He knows all about marine biology and now biology about everything that is biology. And he's going to share some things about God's creation and goodness with us. And can we get a microphone on you here, Brother Ron? I want to make sure that we don't miss out on anything you got to say. And you want to put this on your side belt here somewhere? Just stick it in my pocket. Stick it in your pocket. Okay, brother, the time is yours. You're on the, you're on okay. the recording right now. As Pastor Allen said, my name is Ron Toll, and I moved to Tennessee in 2010, January. In March of 2010, I was introduced to Smyrna. And Terry and Dorothy McCrillis, who this is the first year that I think they've missed uh, because of Dorothy's health, they introduced me to Smyrna. And I'd never heard about the Godhead message before. I uh, listened to it, studied on it, and it made sense to me. Then in, that was in March. Then in April, Granny Ann called me up and she said, uh, I hear you're a marine biologist. I said, uh, I could answer to those terms, yes. I said, uh, what you need? And she says, we got a youth group that comes in, and we got, I don't know, eight or ten kids. Uh, and it's a situation that I'd like you to come and speak to them. I thought to myself, what am I going to do now, you know? And... Caleb was one of these young people, his brother Josh, my daughter, and not only that, but uh, um, Nicole and Ashley, uh, yeah, Ashley Holt. Uh, they were the kids that sat in the front row on the bench. And as I got past them, there was standing room only. All the adults were there, too. I didn't know what to do with that. And so that's a little background on, on how I got involved here. And every year, Granny Ann would call. You going to do another one? You going to do another one? You going to do another one? And I thought, you know, when Pastor Allen called me, he says, uh, would you come and do a couple hours for us? And I said, yeah. And I expect to see all the same old faces. And it's not that way. Uh, there's only about five people in the room that were there before. And I'm really pleased to see that. Blessing in disguise. All the new faces, meaning we got new people coming. And that's really fantastic. Uh, Alan Ewell said something about the aspect of God is a God of order. And I can see that. If you look at the creation, what did he do? First he did the, uh, um, yeah. And then he did land, and then he did plants, and then he did animals. That's all order. That's all by design. And, and, you know, these people that are preaching evolution, I don't see how they can't see that. But 
Basically, what I'm going to say to do, there's not much of it that is going to be new to you. A lot of big words, maybe, but uh, that's the way biology is. But it's a situation that I want you to see things in different terms. You see a buffalo out there. What do you see? You see more than just the buffalo, don't you? What do you see? God's creation. Say that again? God's creation. That's one of them. But, I'll let you pass this around, Alex. Uh, I want to point out to you that there's a whole lot more there than just that buffalo. When the four white man came, there was supposedly 600 million buffalo yep. in the United States. Yep. They reigned on the prairie. 600 million would put one buffalo in everybody's household in the United States. You know? And it's a situation, too. The prairie was much bigger. Prairie started in Penn's Woods. You know what Penn's Woods is? Pennsylvania. That's what Penn's Woods stands for. Uh, and it went from through Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, Dakotas, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Daniel wasn't there that day. That's why I'm going all through this all. <laughs> I'm picking on you, Daniel. <laughs> and uh, Wyoming. Part of Montana, Colorado, Nebraska, uh, Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri, parts of t Kentucky and Tennessee, all had buffalo in them. And I'm fr originally from Iowa. About five years ago, my brother still runs our family farm. He was plowing, and he turned over a calcified buffalo skull out of the fields. You know, I never expected to see buffalo in Iowa, but they were there. They were even in the Smoky Mountains where I live. Uh, so, I mean, it's really a whole completely different thing going on. Uh, um, Now most of that land, that prairie land, is turned into farmland. It's become the breadbasket of the United States. There's still patches, small patches, uh, of areas. I know the state of Iowa's got six different areas. Nebraska's got several. Colorado's got a few. Chicago has got a couple of them. Inner city. It's still virgin prairie. And this prairie, you know, how did it exist before? And that's what I want to get in. I want to show you how intertwining and dependent and, you know, all this world of nature is. I want you to see when you look at a deer standing along the road, and I saw two on my way up here, that you see more than just the deer. You see the whole thing. So we have this buffalo standing out there in the prairie. Uh, what is it about him? He's this big old burly, hairy dude. And on him is flies, uh, ticks, fleas all kinds of different things on the outside of his body. That's, that's all part of the symbiosis, the living together, the coming together, you know? Uh, and then you look at his gut. Inside of it, there's all kinds of decomposers, we call them in the scientific world. The, the creatures that digest his food for him, and so on down the line. And this food that he eats, the grass, he takes it in and chews it up, swallows it, 
It goes down the road a little bit, lays down, spits it back up, chews it again, and before it can be digested. Goes into his gut, all these decomposers work on it, and what happens then? It comes out the other end. So what is that? That's fertilizer for the grass that he just ate for the coming year. And look how big and strong he is. And his hooves, when they hit the soil, they leave an imprint. And this helps to turn the dirt over. It cuts off the stems of grass so that the seeds fall down back into the dirt and regrow. Uh, you starting to see the picture here? And, you know, it's also a situation that in the, the soil, there's all kinds of more decomposers. They decompose as dead material that the heat cuts off and puts it back into the soil. And when it rains, like it just did, it fills those hoof prints up. So it cups the water so that they can uh, get water for the new growth for the coming year. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's an intertwining dependent on everything. And the buffalo and a lot of animals are made to migrate. Mm -hmm. We all know about the migration of birds, but very few of us know that the animals actually migrate too. And so, you know, as they migrate, they're turning over more soil, more soil, planting more plants. It's all there. Uh, not only that, we have, just think about what happens if you get 600 million buffalo on a stampede. Sounds like a train coming through. And look at the dust cloud that they're going to create. And, you know, the wind carries that to other parts and, you know, turns over the soil in other states even. Uh, Northwest Iowa is known for its low, low S hills. It's the only place in the world other than a place in China that low S hills exact, exist. Low S soil is soil that comes out of South Dakota and when they would turn over the, the fields and stuff like that, strong winds came through and they would pick up the dust, take it up in the atmosphere. And for some reason, when they got to the Missouri River, it came back out of the atmosphere. And these OS hills is nothing but really fine dust. Very little, except for some grasses, a occasional tree. But this OS hills is changing. Every time I go home, it's, I can't recognize it because it all changes. And it, you know, it, you get a dirt devil, and he picks up a bunch and moves it over here and so on down the line. But the, the prairie is also, like I started to say, but the 600 million buffalo on a stampede, they're running down this prairie. And they come to a prairie dog hill. And one steps in a hole, breaks his leg, and goes down. What happens then? I mentioned the prairie dogs. They're part of the prairie. So are rats and mice and and shrews and all kinds of little critters, ground squirrels. Uh, but here's, I, I saw a video not too long ago that showed in Yellowstone Park, one of the female buffaloes of a small herd, about 20 or 30, just keeled over and died. And the rest of the herd would not leave it. They would nudge it trying to get it back on its feet and, and so on down the line. And, you know, the wolves came and they protected this dead animal. Uh, that's part of what's implanted into their skull. And finally, they saw that it wasn't going to hurt uh, 
for them to leave. And then a grizzly bear came and ate the carcass, you know. But, I mean, just think about these things. And I picked How Great Thou Art because, to me, that is the whole world. Our God is such an awesome God. Amen. And we can't even fathom a tiny bit of it, of what he has done for us. And all of this stuff is made because he loves us. You know, he don't want this. How many trees is there? 1,500 different species of trees. He could have just made one to create oxygen for us, you know. But he created 1,500. And then some of them are flowering, some aren't. Some produce fruit, some don't. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's such an awesome world that we live in. Uh, now, getting back to the prairie here, uh, living Sandy, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, if you had to name the top four critters that lived on a prairie, what would you name? Okay. What would you say, Eric? Where were you at again? <laughs> if you had to pick uh, pick four animals that lived on the prairie, what would you pick? Uh, Zach? Pronghorn. Pronghorn yeah. is one. We call him the antelope, but he's not a true antelope. Do you know why he's not a true animal? His horns produce a scale and they fall off. On a true animal, they don't do that. They just grow and grow and grow and grow. And we'll get to talking about antelope a little bit later. Uh, so I'm just trying to point out to you, not only do we have these four animals, most people would say elk also fall in that category. Uh, and Dr. Wake knows about elk. <laughs> he lives amongst them. And uh, a lot of people will say wolves, coyotes, foxes, badgers, uh, black-footed parrots. They all live on the prairie. That's just the mammals that I've mentioned. And we have birds. We have the meadowlark, we have bobolinks, and we have the prairie chickens, and the grouse. There's three or four different kinds of grouse, and the grouse are interesting. They form leks on the prairie. A lek is a little area. They, all the males fly into this one area, probably about the size of this room, would hold 50, 60 different uh, male grouse, and they all pick a spot about that big around, and they get in the middle of it, and they defend that territory with their life. And you get a grouse from over here, comes this way to the border, and they're just like that. And if he sneaks, tries to sneak across, I mean, a fight occurs. And it's really something to see. And I've seen uh, the prairie chickens, and I've seen the sharp-tailed grouse on their legs. Uh, and then the female, she'll fly in, and she'll walk across, and they all, they're dancing. Boo, 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 boo. And that's, they're booming, they call that. And, you know, they're all trying to seduce her. And when she finds one, and it's usually in the middle, because she sees him as the strongest and the most uh, masculine, if you can call it that, and she will mate with him. And then she'll fly off, you know, and they're all standing there 
and defending their territories again until somebody else comes in. It, it's now it's a, it's such a unique part of our world, and everybody takes it for granted. Uh, not many people have even seen hardly any of this stuff. I forgot the pheasants, they also live in the... And then you have the raptors, the hawks, the eagles, and the owls. Burrowing owls are neat. A little tiny owl, about that big, he's got legs about that long, and he'll find himself a soft patch of dirt, just dig him a burrow, you know, and he has his young in, or he, she has her young in there, and they come out, the little tiny fluff ball, and, you know, they eat basically just insects. Yet they're all carnivores, you know. I talked about the wolf. Uh, you've never had a feeling until you have a wa wolf watch you. And that happened to me one night. I spent 25 years as a nature photographer. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I could hear leaves rustling, you know, around. And I thought, what the heck is that? And when I got up the next morning at daylight, there was this one lone wolf standing there. And he was just eyeballing me like you could not believe. Made the hair stand up on my neck and my arms and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And I got out of my pickup and I walked around to the back and looked at him and he saw me and he just ran off. But you know another time I had to get up in the middle of the night and I was going some visit a tree and all of a sudden boom right past me. I couldn't even tell what it was. All I could say was it was kind of yellowish. And then all of a sudden another one going this way. And they were went to the edge of the parking lot, turned around, and came, and they had it right straight for me, both of them. I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble, you know. And I just stood there. And they stopped about right there. They looked up at me, and it was a pair of bobcats. And they run around a little bit, and I just stood there, never moved. They ran off to the side into the grass under a tree, and they mated. You know, whoever gets to see a pair of bobcats mate? And I think the good Lord picked on me to have this job, you know. Uh, up in northern Minnesota, they have a bear sanctuary up there. And I went up there to take some pictures of bears one time. And I paid my fee. And I was told, you can go on any trail you want around here. Make sure you do not have any food in your pockets. Mm. Nothing, you know. And if you happen to meet a bear on the trail, put your hands out and talk to him. They were habituated, but they weren't habituated to humans. They were habituated to a white bucket that they would put apples and stuff like that in. And I've got pictures of bears crawling in the back of trucks and my buddy and I went up there on a different time and one of the big bears came up and grabbed his big lens and walked off with it, you know? Five thousand dollar lens and he walked off with it. Uh, we, he got it back but anyway I was walking down this trail and I saw a big black spot like where the creek is back there. Set up my camera Looked through my lens. That's a bear coming, you know. I hope he's not coming down this trail. 
And he walked about, I don't know, 20, 30 yards. Then he went from a side view to a front view. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And he came walking down the trail. And he got about from here to the wall. I took my camera on the lens, set it off the side of the trail. And I thought to myself, do I start talking now? What am I going to do if he comes right up to me? You know? And I started making plans. I wish I had my camera back because I'd put my hand around the lens and aim for his nose, you know? If I broke the camera, that's one thing, but it's better than being eaten. And, you know, he just kept coming. He got a little closer and raised his head and sniffed the air. Took a few more steps, sniffed some more. And I put my hands out and I started talking. His name was Brownie. I found that out later. He weighed about 800 pounds. He was 30 years old. You know, and the next year when I went back, he wasn't there anymore. So I'm assuming he died during the winter. But anyway, he come walking right up to me. And when he got right up to me, you know, I put my hands out. He took a step closer. He sniffed my, the palms of my hands. Then he took his tongue and licked each one of them, you know, <laughs> probably to get the sweat because I was probably sweating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he looked at me and backed up a step. And, and then he came forward again and he just walked right on past me like I wasn't there. But you look at all these different things that are out there that could happen to you. You know, it's amazing at what is available out there. Uh, there's other predators that live on the prairie. I mentioned Badger. He lives in the, the existing prairie dog holes. He makes them a little larger and has their young in the hole and they go from and they eat the prairie dogs. The black footed ferrets, they were almost extinct. And they had a few of them in uh, captivity. They took these ones that were in captivity and mated them, took man out of the picture, or they thought they did, took him put them in prairie dog hills, but they will not eat the prairie dogs. The last two years, they've started on their own doing it. But you know, here's this ranger watching over them, and he has to take them prairie dogs every, dead prairie dogs every day for them to survive. And they, uh, I think three years ago, they had their first litter. And they got them scattered in eight or 10 places around the United States. Um, we talked about the meadowlarks. If the grass isn't that high, they can't make a nest. They can nest on the ground. The bobolinks do too. The pheasants do. The grouse do. They need that grass. And the, the buffalo or bison are the ones that put it there for them. Uh, Men today are just starting to realize how important nature is. Think back 20 years. They eradicated the wolves around Yellowstone. And what happened? In the wintertime, the buffalo, they clear the snow and they eat the dead grass that's there. The elk, they eat the limbs off the trees, the little branches and stuff. And they're much bigger than the deer, so the deer got nothing. They got wasted away disease because <laughs> they had no food. And, uh, you know, government finally saw this, reintroduced the wolves. And, and now, you know, yeah, they kill a sheep every now and then. Yeah, they kill a cow every now and then. But the deer are back, getting back to 
normal populations in Yellowstone. And it's, like I said, it's an amazing thing. Now I'm going to talk about another area of the world. I spent time in Africa. And the prairie there, you got the Rift Valley, East Bank, West Bank, and it's flat and it's prairie in between. The Serengeti. And we have only one species of antelope. We have what we call the big four, the buffalo, elk, deer, and the wolf. Uh, over there, their big five is rhinoceros, hippopotamus. Uh, no, he's not in the big five, believe it or not. Lion, leopard, and cheetah. You know, look, they got three cats, big carnivores, in the top five. We only got one that runs the whole prairie, and that's the wolf. Uh, we got foxes and coyotes, but they're not big five, you know. Africa also got six or eight small cats. Smallest one is smaller than a house cat, and the largest one is about like that. That fit in that same prairie aspect. And, you know, I saw all of these animals. I got to spend time living in a boma. What's a boma, you ask? Now, let's do this. I want the audience participation. I got time to spend in a boma. A boma is like a ranch with all the corrals. It's five houses, actually six houses. Each man that owns a boma has five wives. Each wife has 20 kids. So he's father of 100 kids. And he's got a fence that goes around an area probably about as big as this parking lot in this building. And it's made out of acacia wood, which has thorns, I mean, big thorns. And it's at least 10, 12 feet high. And these houses are nothing more than stick framework. And then they take cow manure. and they let it dry, and that's what they live in. They put a thatched roof on that, uh, and that's what they live in. And, you know, living together, this is a really a good example of living together. The first night I spent in one of the houses, yeah, guy let me sleep with his wife. I mean, not on the same cow. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the same cow head, but I mean, you know, every night one of his wives would visit him in his house, and, the, you know, that was where I spent that, that night. Nineteen kids, me, crawled out on this whole bunch of cow hides, laying on the floor, dirt floor, and, you know, we all went to sleep there. Next morning we woke up. There were 19 kids and me, a dog, a cow that just had a calf, four or five billy goats. Now, I consider that living together. <laughs> you know, the only thing in that house, there's no furniture, and was a fire ring, and that fire never went out. They burned cow dung. and. Most of them people are not much taller than what you are. So the door is like this. And then, you know, if I stood up in there, the top half of the building was covered with smoke. And I couldn't stand on my eyes and stuff, you know, so I crawled around and I thought I was weird. <laughs> but it's a, a situation that one night I was there and, and all of a sudden all this noise and stuff was taking place. And I woke up and I said, what's happening? And one of the kids says, we got a lion out here. He's trying to get in. And everybody gets up, picks up cow dung, 
and throws at him, you know? And he's on the outside of the acacia wall. And it, it's a situation that he finally went away, but the next morning there was a, a dead antelope laying out there. So he had his fill. And while I'm talking cow dung here, uh, there was an Adventist church there. And I went to that Adventist church. And, uh, it's on the West Bank, just outside of the Transmara Game Park. And we were going to take and do a Sabbath school. The men were going to go outside, and the women were going to do it inside. And I got out of the door first. And there was a little two-year-old, like the little girl that was, was here. And he was sitting there, and I picked him up so he wouldn't be in the way because they were going to move a bunch of benches and stuff out. And I picked him up and put him on my arm, and I looked at him. He had a piece of cow manure in his hand. And he was using it for a teething ring. And I said, little fella, I said, that's not good for you. And he just looked at me because he, you know, I'm sure he never seen white whiskers before. Uh, and, but I took it away from him, and he just started crying, you know. He wanted it back. But these people, they don't drink water. The reason they don't drink water is because they got to go to the river to get it. And the river is full of hippopotamus. And they're more dangerous than what the lions are. And they're scared to death of the lions. And because the hippopotamus are in the water, they stir up the bottom. And the water is just full of silt. Uh, the group that I went with, they would go and get 500 gallons of water. And they take it off the truck, put it in a vat, and it sat in that vat for three days to let the silt settle out. And then they'd siphon it off, and they would boil it, and you know, then we could use it. And we used it to shower with and to drink. And you know, one man just couldn't get past that pink water. And he almost came back in a body bag, believe it or not. Uh, he, we put six, and that's all we had, pints of sodium chloride into him. And he was delirious. And we stayed up with him all night and kept him going and so on and so forth, you know. But it's really a different world there. Everybody works. The girls help their mom with the house. The boys, one, two, three-year-olds, all the cows that they have have to go on a trek. They go five miles to the river to make them drink, and this takes place every day. This is done by guys like Caleb and his brother and, and the 14, 15-year-olds, so on and so forth. The 14 and under, they take the goat herd in a different direction, and they uh, take them to water. And the little guys, the little calves, like the one that was in my house that one night, they stand there, they put a rope around his neck, and they hold onto that rope, and that's their job for the day. They stand there with that calf because they know he can't make the trip. And to the people in Kenya, or the Maasai people, let me say it that way, uh, their money is their herd. We also built a well for them. Not one of these people had ever seen water come out of a tube. And that was amazing for them. And now you can drink water. Now you can cook. So if they didn't drink water, what do you think they drink? Milk. No. <laughs> they walk up to this cow, and they feel the neck, and they find the juggler vein, and then they stick an arrow in it, and they fill a bowl with blood, 
and they drink the blood. Not, you know, they don't drink a whole lot of it. One little bowl about that big is enough for five or six different people. I sampled it. What can you say? It tastes like blood. You know? That's what they drink other than water? Yeah, they don't drink water at all. They also do not grow vegetables. They grow no cop crops whatsoever. They only eat meat. And the guy that owned the Boma uh, became friends with his, his son. And I says, so, what's your future look like? He says, well, I just graduated from school. They have a school that they go, all the little ones go to. And little ones, there were some kids there that were 21 years old, you know. But the way they teach, the teacher writes something on the board, and then he reads it. And everybody repeats it. And then he reads it again. And everybody repeats it. And he puts something else up there. And the whole deal is that they teach Swahili and they teach English. Uh, all of the kids could teach, see, speak English. And this, uh, you know, I thought, wow, this is really neat. And I got to know, they had a four-room school, three teachers. When you didn't have a teacher, that meant you were in study hall. And I got to know one of the teachers fairly well because we were there to build a hospital, but the red tape wasn't completed yet, the governmental red tape. And so we painted the school, and we painted the church, and we painted a bunch of stuff in the area, and built that well. And, you know, it, in talking to the teacher, one day she come to school and she had this t-shirt on. And she says, on the t-shirt it said, Kenya no longer circumcises their women. I looked at that and I said, is that true? She said, yeah. She said, oh, about two years ago, they started doing that. And I said, wow, that's neat. And she said, now can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She says, when you get married, how do you go about this? I said, why do you ask something like that? She said, I'm just curious. I said, well, first you go on a date. What's a date? You know, I said, you and this girl, you go out, you go to the movies, or you go eat dinner or, or something. And I said, this goes on for six, eight months, and then you get a little closer and so on down the line. And I said, then you fall in love. And then you ask the girl to marry you. And then soon, you know, you end up getting married. She said, oh, that's not the way we do it here. I said, how do you do it here? She said, this guy walking down the street, and he sees this girl that he likes. He follows her until she gets to her house. And the next day, he brings three cows, four goats. And when she comes out of the house, he grabs her and takes her and says, Dad, these are yours. Uh, I'm marrying your daughter. And they go off. And I, I said, good golly, man. And you know, I told you that John and I became friends. I asked about his family. I said, do you? He was a truck driver that hauled the water and all this kind of stuff. And I said, do you mind if I ask you questions? She, he said, no. I said, how much do you make a day working here driving this truck? He said, you really want to know? I said, yeah, I do. He said, I make a dollar and a half a day. And I said, and you can support, support you and your wife and your little girl on that? Oh, yeah, 
I not only support them, but I support my mother and I support my 19 brothers and sisters on a dollar and a half a day. I said, unbelievable. I said, a dollar and a half won't even buy a sandwich in the United States. And I said, you ain't going to cut that up in no 20 different pieces. But it's altogether a different way of life. Ladies, you know what the angel trumpets are? The flower? It's in the United States, it's a shrub about that high that gets a flower and it looks like a, a trumpet basically, but it hangs down. Uh, I saw one of those over there. I guess they must be found native there. But it was a tree, 90 feet tall. The blossoms were taller than what I am. I mean, everything over there is unbelievable. Went out, you know, on a couple of different safaris. I saw 14 different forms of antelope. I saw the wildebeest, that ugly looking dude. And I stood right where you've seen all these videos where they jump off that bank into the Mara River. I stood right there. At the bottom of that bank was this crocodile that would be almost as long as this room is wide. And he was probably five feet across the back. You know, that's another reason they don't go down the river. Just all these things are living together. And, you know, God made them that way. He is such an awesome God. And we don't even have a clue of how great he is. We don't have a clue what he's doing for us. All we see is whatever we want to see. Now, most of the stuff that I've told you, you've probably heard, <coughs> excuse me, or seen on videos or, or anything on that order. It's altogether just like what you see on these videos. But like I said, we don't have a clue what's going on in our natural world. A lot of it is because we don't want to. And I hope that I can change your mind in seeing this stuff. Now I'm going to get into a few more isolated situations on symbiosis. And I'll get into that more on Friday morning. I'm going to be speaking about life in the oceans on Friday morning. Uh, but in the rainforest, they have a little, what they call a poison arrow frog, about that big. He lives in a bromeliad. Bromeliad is a type of an air plant. It grows like that so that it forms a cup. And rain every day keeps that cup full of water. And he lives in that water. And his mate will come crawling up the tree, out on the branch, and they mate. And the female lays usually five or six eggs in that bromeliad. And, you know, there's not room for six little poison arrow frogs in that bromeliad. So this poison arrow frog, uh, he will take, I say he, she will take one of those eggs, fasten it to her back, jump out of that bromeliad, walk down a branch, and find a, another bromeliad that's not being occupied. She takes the egg off of her back and puts it in that bromeliad. So that the, she does this five or six times so that, you know, her bromeliad stays for her. That's her territory. Uh, you know, if you were the creator and you created something like this poison arrow frog, would you have thought of something like that? Another one is the sloth, again in the rainforest and in 
South America. You know, he hangs upside down his whole life. He's upside down. And he gets a coat a hair about that long. And just think about that. It's growing down rather than up. And when he gets down on the ground and walks a little bit, it looks like one of these new age guys with his mohawk, you know. <laughs> but now stop and think about this. Rook, I'm going to pick on you for here for a second. If your hair was wet 15 hours a day and you didn't get to groom it, what would your hair look like? It would be a matted mess. Any of you girls, you know what it, what it would be like, because I'm sure you've found it. Now this sloth has a symbiotic fungus that grows in his coat that repels all the other hairs. So they don't ever get tangled. Now, I mean, how awesome is that? Here's another one. In Madagascar, there's a tree. The trunk is about as big around as this room. And the branches branch out, cover two city blocks. There's only one. And they've been trying to keep that tree alive and grow babies. Every year, this tree produces flowers, produces seeds, they plant the seeds, but they don't grow. They estimate that tree to be 400 years old. So they went back into history and looked back 400 years. What happened 400 years ago? The dodo bird went extinct. And so I did a little bit of thinking. And so one of the guys there said, Let's try it with turkeys. They brought a whole bunch of turkeys in to live underneath that tree. The seeds fell, the turkeys ate the seeds, and now they got buku, the little trees growing. It needed something in that bird's body to make those baby trees growing. Again, how awesome is that? Here's one that's really bizarre. And Brooke, you and uh, your other half, Robert, kind of fall into this category. This man and woman wanted to get off the grid. And I don't know, they were up in Alaska someplace. That's all I can tell you. And they built themselves a cabin, and they were doing great. And all of a sudden, she turned up pregnant. And she died in childbirth. And dad, you know, was there. And he wasn't going to come back. So he did like the Indians. He built himself a little thing to put the papoose in, carried him on his back. And he happened to find a little cave that was gold in it. And so he would take the baby, set him down in the cave, and dig for gold for about an hour and a half, and then he'd go back home, and you know, he'd feed the baby and let him take a nap, and pack him back up, and away they would go again, and get a little bit of gold. And the baby got to be a toddler, probably like two years old, and he put a harness on this baby. And the, the harness, you know, he tied him to the porch post, let him roam because nothing around there. And he'd go, they'd go for an hour, hour and a half, and he'd come back. The baby was fine, he'd feed him. Came back one time, and the rope had been chewed in half. 
And there was blood laying on the front steps. And, oh no, what have I done? So he took, went into his cabin. And there on the bed was a mama mountain lion and his son. And that son was crawling all over that mama mountain lion. And the boy leaned over and started nursing from the mama mountain lion. And, uh, you know, he wasn't sure what to do, you know. But he could see that that mama mountain lion wasn't going to hurt the baby. It might hurt him if he tried to get the baby. And so he just left it. Came back. He left them lay on the bed. And that was their spot. Mom and mountain lion would pick up the baby by the harness, carry it around here, there, and everywhere. And one night, the mama mountain lion disappeared. And dad went over with the baby and was talking to him and stuff like that. About two hours later, the mama mountain lion brought back a deer. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, so the guy didn't have to go hunting anymore. <laughs> and this went on for six years. Six. And then the lion died. And he didn't know what to do after that. You know, so not only am I, I a biologist, I'm also a storyteller. <laughs> but here about 10, 15 years, I'm a stamp collector. The United States government came out with these stamps. This is how you should see when you look into the wild. You shouldn't just see the bison standing there. You should see everything that surrounds his life that they're in group with. And they have done it for every type of environment in the United States. Are there any questions? Where did the blood come from? I don't have a clue. That was never mentioned. But I'm assuming that, you know, the mountain lion was dragging the baby up and he might have scraped his knee or, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Any other questions? The guy that had the uh, X amount of waves, what was he like? Uh, <laughs> Could you repeat the question to the folks listening in the microphone? And the question was asked, the guy in the Boma with his, all his different wives and stuff, what kind of a guy was he? He was really a good guy. I mean, uh, we chatted and we sat together, we ate together. Uh, you know, he could speak English pretty good. And Where was that at? In Kenya. Uh, and that, that's where they're real short? Yeah. The tallest man was probably 5'7". Is that the uh, Kilahari where they are? Or is that no. Else? The, the Maasai Mara and Trans Mara, the only difference between the two different parks is the river running between them. Mm. And they were in that Okay. Questions on Monday morning, if that's okay. Okay. We're over time, and we need to get into it. We need to get into it. So while you're doing this, I'm going to say a word of prayer, and I'm not going to get down because I won't be able to get back up. <laughs> Heavenly Father, hear us as we pray. Thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us. Thank you for the things that you have given us to show us that you love us. Thank you for this being such an awesome, awesome person. And we want to know you in a much better way. Present these things and open these minds so that they can see what is around them and is surrounding them, that they can do what is necessary for 
us to live in harmony in the wild. And we're going to be needing to do that. Point these things out to many different people. As I pray in the name of Jesus, amen.